Hello, welcome to this video. I've just done a video, um, probably for the third time now, which is called the 10 Greatest Progressive Rock Albums of All Time. Every time I get another angle of doing that, because that video is like, it's like bread and butter to me, you know. It's like, I, I can do one of those once a week, and it'll always get the views. They will always get the views. People love a top 10 video. They love a ranking video. They love um, um, anything about prog on this channel. And when you put all that together, you've got a sure winner. Um, but in doing that yesterday and banging it out and it came out last night, I thought, what's the antithesis of that video? Everything has to have an antithesis or the natural balance of the world won't occur, will it? For every yin, you need a yang. For every um, moldy, you need a scully, don't you? For every chaz, you need a Dave. How long are you going to do this bit for, Andy? Now, for every Tom, you need a Jerry. And every for every Dick, you need a Harry. So, um, it, it needs its natural antithesis, doesn't it? So, I start to think, well, what are the le 10 least proggy bands in history ranked? What would they be? And I started to think about it. It was a stupid thing to think. And I thought that this might be worth a comedy moment on some video at some point, perhaps. And then I thought, um, well, hang on. It's quite hard, actually. Because you start to think, and the first band I thought of, I'm sticking to myself, you see, and you don't know the joke. The first band I thought of was Village People. That was the first band that popped into my head, possibly because of Trump's use of it, uh, you know, in the sort of victory dance for his, um, you know, oncoming inauguration as the President of the United States of America. And, uh, and there's all sorts of people doing that chump dance now, is it there like that? They're all doing that one and they're playing, doing it to YMCA. And I thought, God, that, you know, village people, considering they had, you know, two, they had about two hits, didn't they? They had In the Navy and YMCA and maybe a couple of others, but they didn't, they weren't around last a long time. But culturally, this, this stuff has just grabbed hold of society. And I thought village people like them, they're, they're one of the most unprog bands in history. I thought, well, they're not really because they like dressing up. You know, they don't sing songs about love. They th sing, th sing songs about going to the YMCA or being in the Navy. Now, I know they might be about love on, on another cleverer level, but they like dressing up. And, you know, one of the blokes has got a big walrus moustache, which is very prog, isn't it? And I thought, even though they're not prog, I can still tease out a little bit of progginess in them. And then I start to go through all sorts of bands. You think Michael Jackson, Thriller, that's the biggest album. Well, Thriller's prog, really. It's, it's not full-on prog, but it's prog, you know. It's conceptual. It's got, like, you know, horror film soundtracks. It's got Vincent Price. I mean, David Vincent Price doing a voiceover. That's prog. That is prog. But yeah, it's getting cold in here now. I'm going to have to, shall I put my hat on? Maybe that might warm me up a bit. Really getting cold. If you want to know I'm sat here, I've got a heater down here. I'm always bloody cold on my videos. You know, when I was in my old garage, I was always freezing cold. And it gives you a sort of this sort of approach like this, you know. And you get all that going on, which people think is comedy. It's not comedy. It's, in fact, I'm bloody freezing. So um, I started to go through this and it was quite difficult. And then eventually I came up with a list of acts which um, I don't think have an ounce of prog in them. Uh, or if they do, it's very tiny, and I'll tell you where I think it is. And uh, also, it's interesting, because most of these bands I absolutely hate, because I do like prog, really. Uh, most of these bands I hate, and because of that, I will not be able to tell you anything about them. And then certain people, mainly the anal retentive types who watch videos like this, they will go, and he's going to do a video. If he's going to talk about somebody like this, he should at least know something about them, but he doesn't know anything about them. And I think, you'll oh, do I? Who's making up the rules for this world? Who's making up the rules for my channel? I'll talk about whatever I want. And if I know nothing about the band, I will just know nothing about the band. But I'm still going to talk about them because I've still got an opinion. You know, people who know about stuff, they've sewn the market up on YouTube. There's all people, all sorts of people talking about stuff that they know about. That's passe, right? I'm avant-garde in my approach. 
and I'm going to be doing something quite way out in, in here. He's talking about stuff that I have no idea about. Now, normally, in the old days, I would have gone on Wikipedia and tried to memorise three facts just so I could trot them out so it looked like I knew what I was talking about. But I won't do that for you anymore. It's dishonest. I genuinely, there's, there's on these services, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think there's only two bands I can actually know anything about. Shall we just get into this? So at number 10, and the only reason why this band is on this list is so I could talk about them. Because um, that, they're definitely not prog. And I thought, but I've only put them on here because one of my patrons, um, the great beardy Dardarist Scott Bookman, uh, put a comment up the other day about the band Counting Crows. And he reported the fact that this is the most boring band he'd ever seen in his life, and I answered the comment on my YouTube by saying, well, Scott, um, I, I have got a Counting Crows story, and I've never told it on the channel. It's not much of one, but we're only at number 10 after all. But I'll still tell it. So I thought I'd put Counting Crows on here. Now, I have listened to Counting Crows. Now, I've listened to Counting Crows because of the story I'm about to impart to you, and I'll, I'll tell the story now. So in 2000, I was on tour with Robert Plant and Van Morrison. I've told the Van Morrison aspects uh, of this tour already on my brilliant video where I assess how awful Astral Weeks is. Um, but also, there were these two guys, or maybe three guys, I don't know. And they were on tour with us, and they were very nice chaps, American hippies, right? And I thought, you know, they, they, they've obviously know Robert, and they know all, all the people here. So they're obviously sort of, um, you know, hyper-privileged young men that have just managed to jump on a Robert Plant tour and hang out, out with us because they parents demanded it and so these these blokes are following us around and there was loads of these types always with us you know they were, you know nice people bit hippified dreadlocks when the guy had dreadlocks and you know they got they're following us around on all the gigs it's always there wherever they're there you know where i am they're there and they come up to the gigs and they go hey hey andy that 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 was gig was great man and we thought it was great oh thank you very much thank you very much Ah, you, you're a great drummer, Andy. I mean, you, we've got a band back in the States. I thought, I bet you have some bloody, you know, hyper-privileged band that you can just run because you don't have to get a job. But, you know, can, can tell me about it then. Yeah, and our drummer, I mean, when he goes into a fill, he doesn't always make it to the end of the fill. He says, but you always make it to the end of the fill. I felt like, yeah, because I can actually play the drums because I'm a professional drummer. I'm not just a rich kid that has formed a band with my rich mates and, and, and anything will do. I'm not that. And they were lovely blokes, but they were always there talking about music and all this sort of stuff. And uh, as I got to them, they, they were saying, you know, come and join our band. Why don't you come and play with us? Come over to the States and play with us. You know what Americans like? They're all really nice and friendly. Come over to America. Stop with my house. Sleep with my wife. You know, all that type of stuff. You know what Americans like? And they were off offering all this when I only just met them. And I'm bringing this guy. Oh, I'm English, you know. Surely we need to be formally introduced before I can come over and stop with you. And all this is going on, right? They love lovely people. Lovely, kind, lovely, nice people. And at the, um, on the last show, they came up to me and sort of said, you know, why don't you come to America and jam with us? I thought, I ain't going to bloody do that, not with you. And I sort of fobbed them off. I had quite a long conversation and fobbed them off. Um, and so I go to our manager, uh, the, the late, great Roy, Roy Williams, and I said, you know those two blokes? You know the one with the dreadlocks and the other two there? You know those two there? Who are they? Because they've asked me to join their band. And they went, do you not know who they are? And I went, No. And he went, they're counting crows. And I went, well, who's that? And they said, it's an American band. I said, I've never heard of them. And they went, I've heard of the Black Crows. No, not the Black Crows, Counting Crows. And what do they call themselves Counting Crows for? We've got the Black Crows. How many crow, crow bands do you need? And uh, so when I got home, <laughs> I said to my friends and various people I knew, there's this band for me, man, called Counting Crows. And the reaction to all of them was like, no way. What, you were hanging out with Counting Crows? Yeah, that's me to join their band. No way. Why are they big? Yeah, absolutely massive. They did this, they did the music to bloody, you know, did one of those songs in um, Shrek and all. I was like, oh, really? And I realised that I'd, I'd, I'd... Now, the thing is, I say I'd, I'd made a mistake, but if I didn't know them, I'm the last drummer they need, isn't it? They, the last person they need is some sort of Mahavishnu, Narada Michael Walden you know, school drummer, you know, playing in 1916 all over their sort of 
Americana, middle of the road, acoustic ballady trite that they trot out. And uh, they represent those sort of American bands that are sort of, you know, singer songwriter acoustic. So, I mean, Catty Crows, they're, they're just, they were just the REO Speedwagon of their era. Are they still going now? What are they doing? I don't know anything about them, really. But I've got a story about them and I've told you the story. So I have met them and they were lovely guys. They were lovely guys. And when I checked them out, I did think some of the songwriting was pretty strong. I did I, to be admit that. But they're not prog, are they? Counting Crows. I got them at number 10. So we're up and going, right? So at number nine, I now have, at number nine, nine on the list, I have The Stooges, the band that Iggy Pop was in before we became Iggy Pop. Now, Iggy Pop's not prog. He's sort of early punk, isn't he? We've got a couple of early punk bands here. But The Stooges sort of come out of that sort of psychedelic era. And don't they do a couple of songs on the first album that are a bit long? Now, do we class being a bit long as being a bit prog? A lot of people do this, you know. Somebody will do a, a long song. I mean, it's like Desolation Row by um, Bob Dylan. Is that prog? I mean, it's, it, does it presage prog? Now, you can see here, as I sort of pedal um, endlessly, is I absolutely know nothing about the Stooges. i tell you what I know about the Stooges. Is that there's this bloke called Iggy Pop. He did um, uh, Lust for Life and all those songs, which I like. Passengers is a bloody brilliant song. I think that's great. And before that, he had this band called The Stooges, and they were like a proto-punk band. And it was all very raucous, and they did things like I Want to Be Your Dog, um, which it did. I mean, that was The Stooges and not us. I'm asking you, because I haven't got a clue. I think I want to be... I like... I like it's great. It's, it's, it's visceral rock and roll. I like Iggy Pop. I mean, Iggy Pop is, is this guy... He's, he's drawn from Jim Morrison. There's a lineage that goes Jim Morrison, Iggy Pop, all 80s indie singers. That's the line that goes through. You've got to give him, his, you've got to give him Iggy's credit. And he's a fantastic singer. And he's been involved in all sorts of great musical things. Um, I, I, I like Iggy. I think he's great. Um, I, I don't know much about this. I like I Want to Be Your Dog. I think that's the only song I heard. And I think I listened to one album all the way through once because it got a great big long song at the end, I think. I know nothing about the Stooges, right? I could probably tell you more about the Three Stooges, but I can't tell you much about them. I never liked them at all, at all. But um, not knowing about the Three Stooges, Andy, does not, Make up for the fact that you also don't know about the Stooges. You don't know anything about this band. But I would say they're pretty unproggy. As are, at number eight, the New York Dolls. Who are this sort of glammy, garagey, proto-punk band. Um, I like to mention all bands on my channel at some point. I'd like to mention all the bands in the world. I'd like there to be something. When I die and shut up on fire... When I die and shuffle off, I'm so cold. I'm basically sat on this convector heater. This is absolutely freezing in here. <sighs> but I, sound, I smell like I'm on fire. Oh, I'll tell you what it is. This convector heater is pushed up against my chair. It's melting the sort of faux leather. Bloody hell, it's cold here. It's around the neck regions that I'm getting the... I'm getting the cold. Bloody hell, it's cold. Oh, I can't put my jumper like that. Bloody hell. Woolen. Right, so um, New York Dolls. Oh, no, I have to even talk about them. They're all dead, aren't they? They got who was who was in the lyrics? Was it? Johnny Thunders or was he... I really don't know anything about that band. I hate this type of stuff. But I haven't really listened to it. I'm going to move on. New York Dolls, I've got a number eight. I'll be able to say a bit more about the rest of them, don't worry. At number seven, I've got Jesus and the Mary Chain, right? Um, now, I know about Jesus and the Mary Chain. Um, they did an album called Psycho Candy. It came around about, out about 1984, 85... At that time, I was at art college. Everyone's listening to The Cure and Sisters of Mercy. And then this sort of almost like poster boy um, band comes out called Jesus and the Mary Chain. And they're sat there. Uh, they got the big hair. They stare at the floor. There's everything that ev all my friends wanted from a band. They're really cool. You know, they're sort of mining a sort of 80s version of the Velvet Underground. 
and they come out and they bang their drums. The drummer stands up. They don't need to be able to play anything. They've got low slung guitars. They jangle, jangle, jangle overdrive like that. And they're dull and dreary. Everything that the artsy fartsy art student would like back in the mid 80s. And they were much loved, much loved. And I've told you the story when they split up. One of the guys from Jesus the Mary Chain, he went and formed this band called Primal Scream. Now, when I told this story before, I thought he'd been in the mission, but he had, he'd been in Jesus and the Mary Space. Is it Bobby Gillespie? One of them had, anyway. And I went to see them live, that early incarnation of, and they were bloody awful. Jesus and the Mary's Chain is just pretentiousness personified. It's just, you know, um, posh boys pretending to be rock and roll. Right, when they can't actually rock and roll. You know what rock and roll is? It's Dave Lee Roth. That's rock and roll. Angus Young, Brian Johnson, that's rock and roll. That's somebody with a big black coat and big sticky hair. I could not stick Jesus and the Mary Chain. And it's just droning nonsense. And there's no prog in it at all because prog's interested. Jesus and the Mary Chain is interested. Now, I know in saying this, there's going to be a whole bunch of people my age who watch this channel who are going to get greatly upset and tell me how great Jesus and the Mary Chain is. But I can't tell you how many parties I had to sit, you know, try to chat up some gothy girl that was a bit chubby whilst, you know, everyone around me was getting drunk and listening to Psycho Candy or whatever it's called by Jesus and the Mary Chain and knowing I was going to get nowhere because I didn't have, you know, great big black spiky hair and black lipstick on and a great big black coat. And if they'd found out that I was listening to things like Yes and Genesis, they would probably be hounding me out of that part, me throw me out onto the streets and spat on me, right? So I had to keep it quiet like some sort of um, deviant, Prog deviant, that's what I was back then, a prog deviant. Right, and then, and then what happened? Then you had the cult come out and they did that album, you know, with She Sells Sanctuary on, and they liked that one, and it was that was a bit trippy, and I and then I could start to see, and then they brought out that album that was a bit heavy metal. But I tell you, liking the music I liked in 1983, 84 was not a good idea. You know, it didn't get you anywhere. It didn't get you anywhere with the uh, opposite gender it didn't get you anywhere for friends you had to keep it quiet you know and I sort of dressed as much as I could I I just I have got trauma around this band they really represent the bloody nadir of music in the 1980s god and then and then I got to a point I tell you what happened is this sort of indiness started to make way to a sort of hippified um druggy trendiness right and I then would go, turn up at parties and I'd go up and I'd whip out whatever they were listening to there, you know, probably something awful, like, I don't know, Goody the Swans or something like that, you know. And I would rip that out and I would stick on my gong tape, you. This is why I, I will always give you the, um, the, 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 the kudos it deserves for ruining a million student, art student parties in the 1980s that I was at. But they grudgingly couldn't complain about you because it was so much more mind blowing than anything they liked in their sort of middle class, you know, ultra conservative on their way to getting some sort of yuppified job in the 90s. People that they were, I couldn't stick them, I couldn't stick them. Jesus and Mary Chain, they represent the worst. That's who I've got number seven. So not prog, they're not prog. And you know who they were copying? They weren't even the original. You know what they copied? The band I got at number six, Velvet Underground. Now, all these people are going to come out and tell me how wonderful Velvet Underground are. And I've got, I've got that album, the one with the bloody banana on the front. And the last time I spoke about Velvet Underground, I got it all wrong. And I said that Andy Wall will hold and put them together. And I had about 100 anal retentive tights coming on well you got that completely wrong Andy you got that completely wrong they were a band before Andy Warhol discovered them all he did was promote them and before they came along they were brilliant they were all bloody brilliant because I like them well good for you that you like them right but anybody who likes Velvet Underground is a pretentious fool right they are just think they're too cool for school they're those types right Velvet Underground are bloody rubbish. And all they exist for, the only reason I'm talking about because when they came out at the time, nobody was interested in them. Nobody liked them. They never sold any records. And the only reason why they are now talked about is because a load of people 
who wanted to be trendy and cool in the 70s were inspired to form a band by the Velvet Underground because they realised you didn't need to be able to play or have any sort of school sc- skill. All you need to do was have a cool haircut and wear dark glasses and look moody. Right, and then get a drug habit and sing about it and be, think you're like some sort of Kerouac beat poet, but a rock and roll version of it. That's what you want to do. That's, that's, it's those types, those types of people, the pretentious types. And then they turn around and say that prog's pretentious. And that's why the Velvet Underground are on this list here. Bloody rubbish. I can't stick them. I've got the album. Venus in First is bloody brilliant. Heroin is brilliant. All these tracks are brilliant. I'm not going to say they're not brilliant. They got Nico at one point. She was like quite pretty and she looked cool. It's all about being cool. Velvet Underground, it's all about being cool. And I tell you, once you get to a certain age, you're no longer cool. And you can champion your Velvet Underground. But go and tell that to the kids. Go and tell them, talk to them about the Velvet. They'll tell you to get stuffed. You know, and they'll say, going this to Megan the Stallion or bloody Tyler the Creator. Tyler the Creator? Not Steven Tyler. Not that Tyler. Tyler the Creator. You know, and not a Tyler that you'd hire to do your bathroom. He's, he's Tyler the Creator. Have you heard him? Right? That's what the kids like. That's what my kids talk about. Tyler the Creator. Don't fail me underground. We're talking about 50 odd years ago now. They're all dead now. Any of them left going? John Cale's just about trundling on, isn't he? I've got a lot of spit coming out. You can't see. On the, you know, am I on 4K? I get angry. I start salivating like a dog. And it's so bloody cold. That's cold now. Oh, I'm going to have to get this video done quickly. I'm at 20 minutes and I'm only at number six. Shall we move on to number five? At number five, I have a band I do like. It's Dr. Feelgood. Again, I don't know much about them. They, they just say British pub. They're that sort of... Um, pub scene that also included people like Ian Jury and Alex Harvey and Dr. Feelgood were the, probably the most visceral rock and roll. Now the thing they have, that, well, the reason why they're better than Velvet Underground is because they rock. They actually do rock. And uh, that bloke, Wilco Johnson, what a guitar player. I loved him. When I interviewed the great you know, virtuoso jazz guitarist Martin Taylor on my t- channel who is one of the greatest guitarists on the planet without a doubt. I'm so cold I can't take it. Don't do that. You look like some sort of a... Bloody hell. It's come to this. Um, Wilco Johnson and Martin Taylor. I said, Who, what, name, a, name a guitarist that you absolutely love that they wouldn't expect you to love. And he went, Wilco Johnson. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. I love Wilco Johnson. What a, an amazing rhythm guitarist that turns rhythm guitarists into lead guitarists. And he looked cool, cool. He's a proper rocker. See, rock's not about staring at the floor. Rock is about putting on a performance. Morrissey can put on a performance. I'll never doubt him. I like Morrissey. So can Wilco Johnson. He cuts shapes on stage, right? And so I really do like Wilco Johnson. Never spoken to him on this channel. You know, this story that happened recently when he, he got told by the doctor that he was dying of cancer. And so he goes, right, I'm going to spend my time on tour. It's a proper musician. He believes in the music Wilco did. And so he goes out on this tour. This tour's so successful because everyone wants to see Wilco for the last time and say bye to him. And that he sells that. And his career uplifts and he's out on tour. And the doctor turns around to him and says, Wilco, you're still alive. That cancer you got should be dead. And they found out he got the wrong cancer and he wasn't dying after all. Then he did die. Now, we have a venue up the road from here. I've played it a couple of times called uh, the Wolfram Hall. It's next to the Civic Hall. It's in Wolverhampton. And um, I can remember in the late 80s buying a ticket to go and see Wilco Johnson. And I went up there to, to, to watch this gig. And, um, and this, is what I, <laughs> this is what I think when you, you think of Ducks Field and Wilco Johnson. And uh, I went there. There wasn't that big an audience there at all. There must have been 30 or 40 people in. And, and uh, I went to the bar and I, and I drank three pints back when I used to drink. And I had a bad pint. It's the only time I had a bad pint. And I started throwing up. And I can remember having to leave the gig and walk home, shivering even though it was quite warm, and getting into bed and staring at the floor or the ceiling, actually, and then throwing up. And that that is a little bit like Clockwork Orange. It is, it then 
I, I never really wanted to listen to Wilco Johnson again. But here I am talking about them. Not much information being passed on. But it's definitely not. Wilco Johnson slashed it, Dr. Feelgood. They're definitely not prog, are they? Right, at number four, I've got ACDC. Now, ACDC were going to originally be on the top of this list. They do. I mean, God. I love visceral rock and roll. I grew up listening to that. That's why I'm here. These indie bands, these pretentious bands, they don't know how to rock. Right, if you're going to play the visceral anti-prog card, do it properly. At ACDC, do it properly. But the reason why they're a little bit low down, because there's two instances I can think of when they do go prog. ACDC go prog on Let There Be Rock. That is very proggy. It's quite long. And it's got this sort of conceptual story that's related to the Bible. And Bon Scott comes out and he pontificates like a preacher whilst all this stuff is, is moving around. It's not standard AA beast. It, it's, it, it just has a, a proggy ambience to it. ACDC are so rock and roll that they don't need to be try and be rock and roll. They have no interest in trying to avoid being proggy. They will be proggy if they want because they are truly rock and roll. Whatever they do becomes rock and roll. And I think Hell's Bells, which opens up black, uh, Back in Black, is one of the most proggiest moments in their catalogue. So, February 1980, their lead singer bon, bon Scott dies. He's 33 years old or something like that. Very young, big shock. They're at the peak of their powers. They've just brought out Highway to Hell, Atlantic Records. That's now turned them into one of the biggest bands in the world. They're just about to do it, and they know it. And their lead singer's gone. And he, he was a little bit older than them, so he had a drive, and Bon Scott was one of the greatest frontmen of all time. What are you going to do? So very quickly, they go and grab uh, Brian Johnson, and they get back in the studio, despite this terrible thing's happened, and they make the next album, Back in Black. And when this album comes out, it's even bigger. And they do the very rare thing, ACDC, because we're talking about a proper band here, right? Now, um, when you bought that album, this is ACDC, right? This is the sort of, they sing songs about, you know, um, getting drunk and going to hell and, 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 you know, fornicating. That's what all their songs are about. And they don't change that formula. But then this album comes out and it's just jet black. It's black, that's prog. That's proggy, that is. Oh, they just brought out a black album. They're in mourning for Bon. And you put the album on, and what's the first track on their Hell's Bells? That's prog. Dong. Dong. Where are we? What's going to happen? Dong. We're in a church, and the bells are, the bells are chiming. They're chiming, the, they're, they're chiming the death of their singer, Bon Scott. Dong. And then this guitar comes in and it's like he it floats in as though it's floating out of the darkness. You know. But where's the vocals? Where's the new singer? What's going on? It's all dark and depressing. Now rolling thunder and pouring rain. I'm coming home like a hurricane. You're only young, but you're gonna die, bloody hell, ACDC. What are you singing about? It's, in, it's ridiculous. It's the greatest tribute to Bon Scott there ever could be. And it's an anti-tribute. It's just ridiculous. And they bring it out as a single. I went and bought it. That double A side with um, um, rock and roll, eight noise pollution. <laughs> what, a, what a band. They should be at number one, but that is out and out prog. And number three, I have got, uh, um, they are like the, you've got the Velvet Underground, then you've got the real deal, and that's MC5. And MC5 are the original, you know, kick out the jams, garage, proto-punk band, and they do rock, rock. Now, who's the guy in that band? Was it Wayne Kramer? Was he the guitarist? You know, he did all that. He died this year, and a big deal wasn't made of it, and that's why I put them on the list. 
I'm, at the moment, I'm, I am bringing in, I am researching for my death list. Because when we get to the end of the year, I'll do my video where I go through all the people that's died. And it always is a big thing. So I thought I started off early and I've been going in it really in minute detail. I thought, oh God, Wayne Cramey from MC5, he's, uh, he's died now. Um, I don't know much about MC5. They brought a live album out of it. It's unbelievable. I, I would say that MC5, we're talking about AC, they are the real deal. That's proper rock. Without a doubt, absolutely amazing. I'm not going to talk about them much because I don't know that much about them. But I do like MC5. I think they're great. Exciting, visceral, quite psychedelic, but rocking. And number two, I have, and this was my original number one because it's one of my favourite bands of all time and I thought they should go to number one. But it actually, number one, I've got one of my most hated bands of all time. But at number two, I have Motorhead. Now, Motorhead do not have one vestige of prog in them whatsoever. They don't. And not Ace of Spades, Overkill. The only thing is, is that Lemmy does sing songs about things like the World War Two and bombers and stuff like that. And that's a little bit prog. It's a little but the way they do it, I don't think it's that, that, that proggy. Um... You know, and things like Iron Fist, that's a bit proggy. They, they, they got that sort of thing going on. Um, but I think, on the whole, they're pretty unprog. Lemmy represented, for me, the true heart of rock and roll. Um, Motorhead is just a rock and roll band. That's all it is. And they're one of the best rock and roll bands. And Lemmy was able to... He understood how the hooks worked in rock and roll. He could deliver them all day long. Ace of Space is a masterpiece. Absolute masterpiece. Right. Um... But the thing about Motel that's interesting is they actually evolve out of a prog band. Hawkwind are a prog band. There's very few people on here that are going to say Hawkwind's are not a prog band. And Hawkwind, then they do Silver Machine and tracks like Motorhead. They're, they're, they're a prog band, and yet there's not that much difference. So I think Motorhead, they're at number two because they embody... The, the you know the the the, the I, I, this is the like the antithesis this is the the list which is like the antithesis to my prog list you know when the yin and yang symbol there's the little dot which represents the other side embodied in in the opposite that's what Motorhead is you know I, I love punk bands like the Sex Pistols and the Damned and um, um, the Stranglers I'm not so keen on the Clash but they're, when they're at their best some of my favourite songs I like all that stuff but for me. Motorhead were the real deal at that time, where they were the real, um, they pulled together classic rock, psychedelic rock, prog, punk, new wave of British heavy metal. They just, they just, and they're the band that I heard at 12 years old that got me into music. And they stand at the crossroads of them all. And it's very easy to say, yeah, Motorhead are not prog. But. They are as well at the same time. It's really hard to... Motorhead are one of a kind. They're just incredible. Incredible band. And number one, I have the Ramones. I hate the Ramones. And uh, I've only done this. I put them at number one because I do think that the Ramones do not have any link to prog whatsoever. Right, some prog bands rock, ELP rocks, King Crimson rocks, Yes rock, right, the Sex Pistols rock, Motorhead rocks, right, and that's the thing that they have in common, there's a visceral energy in those bands, the Ramones don't have that for me, the thing about the Ramones, because I, I, I've said this before, I don't like them, and uh, I, I, I crack the joke of saying they're all posh boys, they're not that posh, it's just that they're not full on working class boys, they're just normal people, of course they are, you know, and uh, I I do not understand this love of the Ramones. A few people came on here last time I mentioned them and said they saw them live and it was absolutely amazing. I'm thinking, was it really? It's just, it, they, they, they are channeling more bubblegum pop rock and roll than they are visceral rock 
You see what I mean? Um, and that shines through. And I think if you like that, you're like, I just don't like it. And there's nothing musically of interest to me. The vocals sound dull. The um, they they never. It's not like exciting. Like if it's sort of a white riot by the Clash, that's like oh, you know, that's that's that. It gets you. It's rock and roll. But the the moments never seem to get out of second gear. Um, I hate the way they look with their leather jackets and their funny haircuts and their dark glasses and their sort of American New York. And I know they're not posh boys. They're just normal people. But they they don't seem to have. That that angst, working class angst, it just seems like, you know, when you get to bands like White Stripes and The Strokes, it seems like the blueprint for sort of that um, upwardly mobile middle class band that you, where you don't have to play. The Strokes being a brilliant example of that. And they seem to embody all that, you know. That's what I've got at number one anyway, the Ramones. This is a bit of a strange list, but it is what it is. They were the bands that I think are completely unprog. And what's interesting is, on the whole, I don't like any of them. And the ones I do like, it's because they are truly rock and roll and they know how to rock. And knowing how to rock is hard and it's a skill. And I can't get away from the fact that it doesn't matter how I try and couch it, it with all my intellectual things and champion against this. I do like to listen to people that have skill. I do like to listen to music that I think is rare, that has a, a, an aspect of it that um, is is unique because of the, the unique skill level in a way of the musicians to expose something that's rare right that's that i think that is a value to me anyway got to the end of the video i am absolutely freezing cold you know i only took that jumper off because um i, I had realized i had the correct hat to do that to, to to um embody brian johnson in hat form and i'm freezing Yeah. You know why it's so cold here? Can you see it? You know why it's so cold? There's no heating. There's no heating in this place. The reason why there's no heating is because we've taken over this factory. We're trying to get this thing off the ground where we can, you know, open it up to the community and do all sorts of different things. And we're trying to make it work, get people in. And, and I'm, I've been brought in to do my YouTube videos because, you know, they hope that I, it will become a fixture and people will know about it, you know, because I've got a bit of a profile. But everyone's terrified because we've got to pay the heating bill. And for a big factory like this, this is a lot of money. There's no way of paying it. So the heating's not on at the moment. We're all running little fan heaters and that will cost. Uh, and um, that's going to have to be paid by the organisation, the charity. And so uh, we're trying to get through. Once we get to next spring and it starts to warm up a bit, we can really start to put some events and we can establish it. And hopefully next winter we will be able to stick the heaters on <laughs> so when we invite people in. I did a gig in here the other day and everyone was like <laughs> freezing. And I interviewed a comedian yesterday and when we were chatting, I looked at him and he was like, <laughs> everyone's freezing. So um, before I say all the normal stuff at the end of the video, I always say, if you look down below, there's a link to the Jelly Man's Heritage Art Charity um, where you can donate to the organisation behind this. And I can tell you that all this organisation want to do is take over this factory, save it so it, it, it stays here because it's such an incredible place. It's so peaceful and beautiful. And when I first came down here, it was like, as soon as I walked onto it, I felt relaxed and I thought creative types need to come down here. And then there's all these incredible rooms, including an 800 seat venue. We've got loads of rooms like this, seating rooms, meeting rooms, all this type of stuff. And we want, we want it to be a place for creative people, not just locally but also nationally to be able to know i'm going to go there i don't know what to do and i hope that i can help which i've done all my life you know I, i've helped people to find their creative way that's what i've done so um i'm here i would love to be able to do that um the charity needs to work and i think when we get to next year we can do run some proper events but at the moment um we are living on the tiny little donations that are coming in from a few places they've run run some open mic nights and had some you know, like fairs down here. And uh, this channel also is bringing in a tiny amount of money for them. So I've really pushed it on this one. There is a link down below if you'd like to donate to this charity, the Jellyman's Heritage Arch Charity. If you want to see what they're actually doing and how worthy it is, that would be great. 
Uh, you could also like this video and subscribe and you could become my patron of mine, which you can become for free. All that stuff's free. But you can also become a paid member of my Patreon. Or you could also drop a little bit of money into my PayPal tip jar as well. This is how the arts work nowadays. So if you like what I'm doing, you support what I do. And you support some of the stuff I'm trying to do for community and arts. And you can, you know, realise that a lot of the stuff I've just done today was just, you know, to have a bit of a laugh and a joke. And, uh, you know, do you agree that these, none of these acts are proggy? You know, what, what are the most done prog... That's really what this video... What are the most on prog bands? And you've got 10. 10 to have a think about there. Not much, you know. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, see you all. See you on the next video. Bye-bye. London-centric arse mongrels who wouldn't know a hedge if it jumped up and bit them on the bum.